Ja. Då ska jag önska alla välkomna till Kulturhuset och Bibliotekplattan till kvällens samtal om begreppet förlåtelse. Eh, särskilt varmt välkomna när vi vill ge till kvällens eh, huvudpersoner. A warm, very warm welcome to Cynthia Haven and Anders Arborelius. Eh, I'll just say a few words in Swedish before I give the word to you. Eh, det här programmet hade inte varit möjligt om inte hade haft ett samarbete med förlaget Ars Interpress och Alexander Darjev som står här borta. Eh, förlaget säljer lite böcker också på ett bord här. Eh, titta på dem efteråt, de är väldigt bra. Kan jag säga. De finns i biblioteket också. Eh, Cynthia Haven vill också tipsa om sin blogg eh, som är, har adressen bookhaven .stanford.edu Vill ni ha den uppskriven så kom till mig efteråt. Detta om detta. Now I leave the word to you. Welcome. Thank you for having me. This is my first trip to Scandinavia. So this is quite exciting and I just got off the plane. Uh, can you all hear me? It's coming? <laughs> How's this? <laughs> okay. Well, I was asked to think of a topic uh, for tonight, and uh, in preparation for this, I reread a story. Um, I have just finished a biography of the French theorist René Girard, who wrote a great deal about the roots of human violence, uh, the escalating cycles of vengeance, and um, about the nature of desire and how we use scapegoating to relieve social tensions. And one of his more uh, interesting contentions, he was a friend of mine, was he said that the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis is the first real story of forgiveness in written human history. I haven't been able to prove him wrong. I tried, I'm sure he looked too. And so in preparation for this, I went back and reviewed the story in, um, in Genesis. And I'm told that a lot of you know it, so I'll retell the story. Um, Joseph was one of 12 sons of uh, Isaac. He was one of two sons of the more favored wife, Rachel. And the other sons were uh, either of the handmaiden or of um, the servant of Leah or of Leah herself. This was a cause, among other things, of a great deal of jealousy and resentment. And um, Joseph was smart, able, perhaps a little full of himself, and he managed to get his brothers upset enough so that they decided to do away with him when they were alone. And one of the brothers, Judah, comes forward and says, no, let's not kill him. Why don't we make some money off this and sell him into slavery instead? The father is brokenhearted. This was a favorite son. 20 years roll by. The son who was sold into slavery becomes a viceroy of Egypt. They come begging during a period of famine. Uh, the brother sets them up for some tests for their loyalty to see if they've changed. This is a great story of forgiveness. But what attracted me on rereading it this time was the role of Judah, the one who had decided to monetize the process of getting rid of his brother. When he becomes before the viceroy, and, and the, the viceroy, Joseph now, asks for his full brother, Joseph, the other son of, Le of Rachel, um, Judah says, no, this will break the heart of my father. 20 years before, He didn't give a damn about the heart of his father. He was willing to do it. Something's changed. He says, he says, this is one of my father's two sons, and the other one is gone. So he's acknowledging the favored role of the wife that had caused all this resentment. And he, he who is willing to sell his brother into slavery offers himself as a slave rather than see harm come to his brother. So it's not only a story of forgiveness, but it's a story of people who need forgiveness and people who change. And that occurred to me that that's what's missing in the idea of forgiveness today, is it's become transactional rather than transformational. I give you this, and if you say I'm, you're sorry, I'll forgive you. And it, it becomes like running an accounting book and not something that is fully transforming thing. And for the 
we have to forgive whole ranges of people who we'll never see again, the dead grandmother or, or whatever. But I think ideally that the process is supposed to be fully transformational between two people. It's one of the few real chances we have of reaching the other, not doing it as a self-help so that we'll feel better, but because we all carry a dual passport in life. We're both perps and victims, and we need forgiveness and we need to forgive. And when you do it that way, it's like one hand washing the other, and less like me doing a favor by <laughs> forgiving you when I've done incredibly bad things for which, anyway, I would like to hear your words. <laughs> I'm very happy that you chose the Bible. I will say something about Swedish mentality, where the Bible is not so very present. And maybe that's why forgiveness has become quite difficult. I'm still thinking about Swedish authors. How many of them have accused their parents for being parents? Of course, parents make a lot of mistakes and they do bad things, but I have the feeling that many people are fighting with this anger against their parents and also against God. For many people it's difficult to forgive their parents because they're not the ideal parents they wanted to have and God didn't make the world better. So I think in our mentality forgiveness is lacking in many parts of our society. And at the same time, there is a real need for forgiveness. Just a little beautiful story about Slatan Ibrahimovic, you know, the famous football player, who was brought up in one of the worst areas of Sweden, in Malmö, Rosenborg. His parents were not the best parents, and the father had problems with alcohol. The mother always hit the children with wooden spoons. And she broke the spoons, but for Christmas, they gave her wooden spoons. <laughs> I think it's a sign of forgiveness. Our parents are not the best parents in the world. But still, we have to forgive them, we have to accept them, we have to really try to forgive them. And just forgive me. <laughs> Thank you. Is it better? It will be better. Uh, I will yeah. raise your hand. And we also see the tragical consequences of this lack of forgiveness, that so many old people are rotting in, in old people's homes. They are not visited by their children. They are forgotten. And so many people f feel this loneliness, this break between the generations. So I think to help people to learn to be forgiven and to forgive is a very important task. Because people really long for that, but they don't know how to do. And how could we help people to see that if you want to break this attitude of non being forgiven and not being able to forgive it can mean so much. And this history from the Bible. And maybe this little history about Slatan Ibrahimovic can show us that there are so many ways of looking for forgiveness. I think one of the great, for parents, one of the great ways that you forgive your parents is, maybe it's got to do with this falling birth rate now, is you become a parent. You realize that what for your child was an epic event for you is just a very, very bad Tuesday. <laughs> And that things are rolling by so quickly. Yeah. We've lost the awareness. I think this is one of the problems with forgiveness, too, is um, wrong. Well, Shakespeare wrote, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. That was in Hamlet, so it has to be taken with that. But when you have no standards of right or wrong that are commonly held or objectively held or whatever, then being it's just a matter of opinion. If people don't think that they've done anything wrong, then there's nothing to forgive. So I've, I find that we're in a peculiar situation, at least in my life I've seen, where people want me to forgive them. 
but they don't want to acknowledge that anything has happened. So you're put in this position of something that was done to you that changed your life. I mean, you bear them no ill will, but it's just dumb. And that, I had a C.S. Lewis quote about that. The demand that God should forgive such a man while he remains what he is, is based on the confusion between condoning and forgiving. To condone an evil is simply to ignore it, to treat it as if it were good. But forgiveness needs to be accepted as well as offered if it is to be complete. A man who admits no guilt can accept no forgiveness. Yeah, and it's just like if, you know, if you think that an axe murder is okay, then <laughs> how can that process happen? And I think in our culture, feelings of guilt are very common, but guilt is not. People have a certain feeling that we hear, we lived, we are too rich, we, we have mismanaged the society and the world, but they don't know how to cope with that feeling of guilt, because the guilt has to be recognized and had to do something about it. And in a secularized society, there is no, one, no authority to tell you you are forgiven, you can start anew. And many people really long to be forgiven, but they fear are in a kind of things can change. But it's very difficult to be concrete about these vague feelings of guilt. <laughs> in the air, it's in the, well, it, in the atmosphere, and to help people to really realize this was not so good, this was bad, I have to change, I have to be transformed, could be very helpful. But then you are looked upon as moralizing us. So that's one of our difficulties, I think, here in our culture, to help people to get rid of feelings of guilt, to see if they can see that there is a concrete guilt, you can be liberated, you can be free. But from these vague feelings of guilt, it's been nearly impossible to be free. There's a poem by Czesław Miłosz, and I wish I'd brought it, <laughs> called uh, At a Certain Age. If someone's got a cell phone, you can probably look it up. But uh, I think it's, he talks about, um, who to confess to. And he says, you know, he tried to confess to the cat, but the cat as always was immoral and went to sleep. The dog wanted to hear an order. And uh, he felt embarrassed about paying somebody with a diploma to talk about his problems. His friends don't want to hear about things long gone by. And he said, where would I go? A church, maybe a church, but then say what? You know, what, what sin am I confessing that once I saw myself as noble and good <laughs> and now I see a big frog open his eyes and say, that's me. And it's, it's more that I, I think beyond that we've done something. It's that we're persistently selfish. Yeah. We're persistently bitter. That we have these mind views and these uh, attitudes that pervade everything we do, and it's, it's, it becomes very inspecific in that way. And, and I think also many people have their identity in what they do, not in what they are. And for them it's difficult to see that not everything we do is good, but I can be good inside, even if those things I do are not very good. That I have to grow so that what I do will reflect what I am. It's a process of really becoming more what you are than what you do. Because if you have your identity in what you do, it's difficult to see that you do something wrong. Because then you are bad, you are not accepted. So to help people to really uh, get rid of this feeling that I'm not good because yeah, what I have done has made me a bad person, but that I can change, that to forgiveness is possible, it's also for me, and to tell people that I forgive you can really be a message of hope for so many people, I think. Yeah. How did... 
you know, a sense of sin has gotten such a bad name in today's culture. It's just um, people, but it's actually kind of liberating to see I'm screwed up. I do things that are screwed up. I, it's, it's the wound in the flesh. It's something that we can move beyond. It can. Yes. It's, uh, yeah. it's true if you can really repent and say that thing is not good. I want to get rid of that. I want to start anew. And uh, that can be enormously important for people today to know that I don't have to carry all these things of my former life behind me. I can be free. I can get rid of it. But there has to be someone to tell you that. And I think that's one of the main lacks, that there is no authority of the state, or the society, or the culture, no institution for giving forgiveness. If you have a faith, of course, it's something different, but for those people who don't have, it's very difficult to be uh, overwhelmed by the gift of forgiveness. It can happen in a personal relationship, it's very deep. And you can see that in marriages, you can see that in families. That that can transform the atmosphere when people really know this person loves me so much that he or she can forgive me even those bad things. It can change a person. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite characters in literature is Father Zosima in the Brothers Karamazov. Um, and a couple quotes from him. Truly, each of us is guilty before everyone, for everyone. Only people do not know it. And if they knew it, the world would at once become paradise. There is only one salvation for you. Take yourself up and make yourself responsible for all the sins of men. For indeed it is so, my friend. And the moment you make yourself sincerely responsible for everything and everyone, you will see at once that it is really so. It is you who are guilty on behalf of all and for all. Well, I have a story. I wasn't sure I was going to tell it, but in this regard, um, it's a powerful story, and I wasn't sure it was going to be appropriate. Uh, I have a friend who was in a situation of date rape, and... Uh, because the situation was so ambiguous, nobody wanted to believe it. And she was, in fact, penalized for this, which made it worse. She was going through flashbacks and everything else. And this was the man that she was in love with, was going to marry, and all of that, which just compounded everything. He denied everything. This went on, for those of us who were her friends, it was kind of hard because she was going through so much to continue to be a supportive friend. And what happened was, a couple years later, the man came back to her, and he'd married somebody else, and he was in tears. And he said, you were right. Everything you said was right. I had a history of violence, and I'm so sorry for what I did to you. I wasn't around firsthand. I only heard her talk about this. But it was magic. I mean, even in a situation that extreme, it was magic. I mean, they became friends. And it completely transformed the situation. That's an extreme case, because we think, you know, there are extreme cases where we don't think we can ever go there. I mean, if someone's beating you, you obviously will have to forgive them from afar. His father Zosim even has an example of um, where he says, if you forgive a criminal who's committed a murder, and he laughs at you and spits at you, he said, don't worry, he'll get it later. <laughs> he'll understand later. It doesn't have to be right now. But that, that friend, was I've always thought of that in terms of forgiveness, of this remarkable, I mean, you, it sent chills down your spine when you heard her talking about that in a situation like, do you run across many of those? Well, sometimes, uh, yeah. I think some of the deepest friendships are between people who have been able to forgive one another. Because if you really forgive and are forgiven, there will be 
a deeper bond between people because then you both know that it's not so much about feelings but that there is something deeper well i would say something divine in being forgiven and being able to forgive and um, uh, as you said there are these stories of really great guilt being forgiven and that's that's very hard. I've heard and met people who are in uh, prison for, for genocide. You know, Sweden has become very popular for those people, those who are um, given their trial at Hague. They can ch make a choice to come to a country where the prisons are regarded as better. Swedish prisons are quite popular. So uh, some of them come here and it can be really impressive to see how they s see this deep need of being forgiven. Of course, they cannot be forgiven by those people who have been killed. But still, it can be a kind of process where they see that uh, I have done terrible things but I can somehow be transformed. I don't have to be identified with these terrible deeds forever. Even I who have done, who have recognized, who have repented, I can, I can be changed, I can be transformed. And I think that's one of the most important things for people to realize that up to our last instant in life we can, we can be changed, we can be liberated from this uh, burden of guilt and terrible deeds. We are not bound to be totally identified with that. And of course you can say how should persons who have been in concentration camps, who have been tortured, who have been seen their parents being killed, how can they forgive? Well, we cannot demand that of them, but some people can. And of course, that will make them changed. I remember uh, some of those people who came from the concentration camps, you know, after the war. Uh, many people came directly from concentration camps in Poland, uh, many Jews, but also many Catholics. And when I come to a parish, there is often someone showing me the telephone number of Hitler. And they have suffered a lot, but I have never met any one of them uh, being bitter or being full of vengeance. Somehow they have been able to to forgive. And of course, you would see that on their faces, that they have suffered immensely, but at the same time, they are not identified by always being a victim, being bitter, full of vengeance. I know it's heroic, but I think that has made them free. We cannot demand that of people who have suffered so much, but I would say, if they can, forgive even those things, uh, there is hope for the world. Because otherwise violence will escalate. We see that in all the conflicts. If there are not people being able to say, stop, I don't want to go on uh, being a victim, wanting vengeance, wanting revenge. That can stop those cycles of violence. I guess I keep coming back to um, Dostoevsky's truly everyone, each of us is guilty before everyone, for everyone, only people do not know it and if they knew it, the world would at once become paradise. And I was thinking of um, Jan Karski, does everybody know the story of Jan Karski? Um, he was a, worked for the Polish underground and uh, during the war, uh, he was speaking to Jewish leaders and they said, go to the West and tell them we are to die. Tell them, 
you know, what is happening. And they took him into the Jewish ghetto where he saw horrific things. Um, you know, a young German boy just picking off people for sport, hearing the cries of the people that fell and the laughter. Of it. It just, um, and he went to the West. And there's a movie, a new movie that's been made, uh, Jan Karski and the Lords of Humanity, where he talks about his conversations with, and he talks about going and meeting FDR, and FDR on his cigar saying, tell your people that we will rebuild them after the war. <laughs> tell them all of these things. It was completely ignoring uh, what he was saying. So it, there's a complicity of all of us for these things, and I'm trying to understand that. Dostoevsky's words, uh, the role that we've all taken in that. Um, there are remarkable stories of forgiveness. Um, I, I know the story in uh, South Africa, a young, attractive, blonde Stanford student before things changed, was run down by a mob and, and beaten to death. Uh, talented woman on a, some sort of Fulbright or something like that. And uh, it was devastating you know, to hear of that and to realize something so far away was close to us in Palo Alto in that sense. And her parents started a foundation to work with that. And the man that killed their daughter, they took him in. She, they took him into their home and treated him like a son. And I don't know where you get that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where you can get that. But you were said to bring up some of the social consequences of forgiveness. And again, I've been working with the idea ideas of Rene Girard, and he talks about um, escalating cycles of violence. I won't get into the whole theory of how competing desires lead us to reach for the same thing, and how we eventually scapegoat someone to do that, but also that we get caught into this cycle where we imitate our enemies and they punch us, so then we punch them harder. They punch us even harder, we punch them twice harder. And it was interesting, I found a quote from a Jewish atheist, Hannah Arendt, who says very much what Renee was thinking. She wrote that forgiveness is the exact opposite of vengeance, which acts in the form of reacting against an original trespassing whereby far from putting an end to the consequences of the first misdeed, everybody remains bound to the process, permitting the chain reaction contained in every action to take its unhindered course. Forgiving, in, on, in other words, is the only reaction which does not merely react, but acts anew and unexpectedly, unconditioned by the act which provoked it, and therefore freeing from its consequences both the one who forgives and the one who is forgiven. And I think that's radical forgiveness. <laughs> no, but it's always hopeful when people can take that step. But many people need a lot of help and support because uh, we know that when we have been really hurt, we have, it has to be a kind of interior conversion into something else, something new. And it's really tre tremendous to see that people are able to take that step. Even if they can have bad feelings afterwards. And that's what important to know, that even if your all your feelings are not that of forgiving, or you can, on a deeper level, say, I forgive you. Maybe you will not forget, you will feel from time to time anger or uh, frustration, but your deepest personal will is, I want to forgive this, I want to say stop to this circle of vengeance and revenge. Uh, because today people rely perhaps too much on their feelings. If they feel uh, bad about a thing, if they feel that they are angry with that person, can be very difficult for them to say, I have a deeper personality than my feelings. There is something more to it than this uh, feeling of being angered and being hurt. And for many people, I think that's important to realize they have, they have something deeper inside than those uh, feelings and 
the surface and if they really stick to that interior and found part of themselves it's also easier to uh, forgive and to be forgiven I would say um. This is going to be difficult, too, because I actually know some of the people involved. There was a national news story last week about a kind of scandalous publication online called Gawker. Did anybody say it probably didn't make Swedish news? Um, there was a multi-billionaire who was outed by them for being gay 10 years ago. I don't remember how long ago it was. But when a suit, suit surfaced against this magazine without letting it be known till it was learned he funded the lawsuit and in fact I heard later that he had a team of lawyers going through the publication every day to look for something that might be food for a lawsuit and he won and he's driven it out of business which has raised all sorts of free speech issues but a number of people including a friend a mutual friend that we have thought it was vengeance that he was upset about being having been outed as gay and uh, went after them consistently for 10 years. But this is just to show that it's not always in South Africa or and it can happen in the legal courts of America or Sweden, I expect, too. But when I was talking to the mutual friend about this, I began reviewing my own daily thoughts and seeing how many of my thoughts are about getting back at someone or how sorry they will be when they find out which is a subtle kind of vengeance they'll be sorry I'll do this and they'll be sorry that all day long or even gossip gossip is a very passive form of vengeance you can't get back directly at the person because they're more powerful than you are but you can tell 12 of your friends about them and how rotten they are <laughs> And it's a subtle kind of vengeance. And I just realized how much of my thoughts daily are wrapped around how right I was, how wrong they were, and how I'm going to get back. <laughs> yeah. no, that's why it's so important to make a difference because those feelings that are always swirling around and what we really want to do. And uh, that can be very helpful for people to get a kind of distance to those immediate feelings that pop up, the thoughts of dependence, I want to say that, I want to, well, to punch him or something. <laughs> but what do I really want in life? What is really important for me? Is it to seek a deeper relationship with those who have done wrong to me, who do not understand me, beat my parents, beat my wife, my... That it is possible to get rid of those feelings of, and start anew. And I think for many people that could be very helpful to realize that they are not really prisoners of their feelings. They can move beside them, beyond them, and really realize that they have something deep inside, that there is a part of them longing for this universal solidarity and friendship and that if I forgive a person, somehow the world becomes better. But also those small little uh, gestures of forgiveness can help the world to grow to something better. We cannot change all the world, but we can change that little piece of the world around us and inside us. We have this freedom of ours to do something about it. The world, our world, because uh, so many people feel powerless when they hear about well, the war in Syria, Iraq, and so on. It's a very great danger to become depressed and frustrated that it's not worthwhile to do something to change the world. But if we have this real faith that I can do something great in small things. There is something that can change in me and in people around me. If I try to get rid of vengeance and revenge and concentrate upon starting a new forgiving and being forgiven. I think we have a sense of scale 
to this thing in Syria is bigger and more real, and my own life is not, yeah. doesn't matter, and yet I have close to 100% control over my life, and maybe point zero zero zero. It, it's just easier to carry a protest sign downtown in front of an embassy than it is to just sort of yeah. let go of some. One question I've had is, is I think we have a problem with language and forgiveness does not, can, gets conflated with reconciliation, and reconciliation is not always possible. How, how have you dealt with that when, in situations where, I mean, even in situations like the ones that I described with that friend of mine, uh, reconciliation was possible even in the situation that extreme once he came forward. But certainly we have forgiveness that has to happen with people who are dead, for whom there's not going to be a reconciliation, or for people who are far away, or like in Dostoevsky, the man that you forgive and he spits at you or whatever and laughs and goes away and does whatever he's doing some more. Um, so how do, you, how do you balance sometimes the, the wish not to reconcile or the belief that it's impossible is itself the illusion? Um. Yes, you're right. And we know that forgiveness is not always accepted. Uh, people die, people are away. So I think forgiveness as such can take part, even if we return to the question of forgiving your parents, for instance. Uh, it's often when they are dead that people start thinking about, I should have done that. I didn't go to visit my mother, what can I do now? And then I think it's very important to know that there is a forgiveness beyond the limit of death. Of course you have to have a certain faith or in order to realize that, that uh, we are not bound to be unforgiven or not being able to forgive those who are dead or are away. We might not get the answer, but really to try to see that what I couldn't do for my parents now, I can do it in another way. I can show the love and affection to other people that I didn't give to them. That I can be forgiven beyond death, beyond distance, beyond well, political or other uh, limits that can be hard to cross. Because it's, it's a mystery. It's not just uh, people telling you, I forgive you, and I receive that. It's something deeper, something so human that it's uh, universal. I can also ask forgiveness for things happening to other people. I can take that upon me. There is a kind of brotherhood of forgiveness that we can enter. Uh, because there is always so much guilt in the world, there is so much need of forgiveness, and it's important to know that, as you say, actual reconciliation is not always possible. There is not always the possibility for me to know that uh, I have been forgiven. But so, if we go further, deeper. Analyzing forgiveness, I think it's important to realize that it's on the very deepest level of humanity. It's a mystery. You cannot explain it. You cannot explain it. You can just be overwhelmed by the possibility of being free and that we too, even if we have feelings of anger, can transmit something that is greater than our heart. I like the idea that it's bigger and it's much more mysterious because that gets so far away from the transactional, you know, you go to the letters columns in the newspaper on the Dear Abby or whatever this Swedish equivalent is and always well, like, he never came back and said he was sorry and it's just like everything's hung up on two words and nothing's going to move until somebody gets their piece of flesh, their silver coin. You know, then I go back to Ju the story of Joseph and Judah, you know. Twenty years had gone past. 
You wonder what was going through Joseph's mind in that 20 years. It's just like the first question he asks of his brothers. Uh, and in this new translation I have of it, um, something, something uh, they bring out, the footnotes bring out things that when he finally says, everybody leave the room except the brothers, he begins talking to an Hebrew. And all of the previous conversation had been through an interpreter. So suddenly he's proving it. By, but the first question he asks is, is my father still alive? He's had 20 years to think about this. And they've had 20 years to think about it too, of course. But I wonder, after the reconciliation, would they go back and say to their father? I mean, <laughs> they've hidden this crime for 20 years. Um, do you go back and say, it was all a mistake. <laughs> He's back now. They must have said something. But they don't tell that part of the story. But it's the mystery of it comes through in that story. It's a surprisingly, I mean, this is dealing with literature, but it's a surprisingly sophisticated story in the balances of the one who is willing to enslave, becomes willing to make himself a slave, the one who would not consider his father before. Is, there's a beautiful balance to it, even in the planting of silver which is how he tests his brother as they plant a silver cup on the brother that he, he's going to. And, and there, there had been silver exchanged in the selling of the slavery. So once again, silver, the thing turns on the exchange. of. It, it's a beautiful story I, uh, in terms of literature. It's surprising that 1000 BC, I'm, I'm not too familiar with the rate. Some of the Vedas had been written by that point, but there isn't much that we have from that period that's really... Uh, it's eternal truth. <laughs> this is possible, but difficult. And I think today, there is uh, such a great need of forgiveness. People have to be reminded of that. Well, it's possible to forgive your parents, even if they are dead. And uh, you can also be forgiven what you didn't do to them. I often have to speak to people about that because uh, it's so common in our country that uh, there is something in between the generations that, yeah. Well, it's rooted in the sense that we're owed, isn't it? Yeah. We have this idea of what's coming to us. Yeah. We see the neighbor kid and he gets stuff that we didn't get or treatment that he didn't get and we expect that we don't make the same expectations of ourselves often. No, no. We make excuses for ourselves, but parents, one is expecting to get. <laughs> and it's often combined with not being able to forgive God. I always think about being my bad man. All his films are real about that. His father was a stern Lutheran minister and God behind that. He's a very religious man, but he didn't want to recognize it because the father wasn't the father he had wanted to have. For him, God wasn't the God he wanted to have. And I think it's a bit typical of Swedish mentality that Life wasn't what we had expected it to be. Society wasn't what we expected it to be. Parents, everything. Because we have so big expectations and such big ideals in our society that we see that we are not able to cope with that and that we accuse people and ourselves that, that we are not as good as we are supposed to be. And it can be very difficult to get rid of that constant feeling of guilt that you do not really, you are not really able to be what we are supposed to be. Our parents, God, society, there is always something lacking. And to be forgiven could be really something great for a person in that situation. Did you find that poem? I saw that you were looking on your cell phone for that poem I mentioned. Did you find it by chance? Somebody was looking. I noticed when I mentioned that. No, okay. I was, I was going to read that poem by Miłosz at a certain age, but I don't think I can pull it up on my cell phone, which is... I think I may have 
Ah, okay. I should have written it down, but I thought, no, that won't fit the conversation. For me, it, it all turns on just seeing what a flawed creature's oneself is. And I know it's kind of a cliche to forgive yourself, but you just, you realize that I am a lost cause, not all those others. That, you know, I need all the help I can get to just be human in the airport. <laughs> Coming here and not, you know, as I often say, I, I go from zero to bitch in two seconds, you know, it's, all it takes is a small friction, a late plane or something else to turn me into a creature I wouldn't recognize. And yet I expect other people to behave like archangels. <laughs> sure. Here's the poem. Anyway, I, I kind of gave you the pricey of it. But it might be a nice note as we're getting close to wrapping this up. What time is it? Getting close. This is called At a Certain Age. We wanted to confess our sins, but there were no takers. White clouds refused to accept them, and the wind was too busy visiting sea after sea. We did not succeed in interesting the animals. Dogs disappointed expected an order. A cat, always immoral, was falling asleep. A person, seemingly very close, did not care to hear of things long past. Conversations with friends over vodka or coffee ought not to be prolonged beyond the first sign of boredom. It would be humiliating to pay for by the hour a man with a diploma just for listening. Churches, perhaps churches, but to confess there what? That we used to see ourselves as handsome and noble, yet later in our place an ugly toad half opens its thick eyelid and one sees clearly, that's me. <laughs> that's At a Certain Age by Czesław Miłosz, the Nobel Polish poet. I think when one sees when one is the toad, <laughs> not the prince. <laughs> One cuts a little slack for others. Yeah, but it's also a beautiful accent that somehow we have to be forgiven by all creatures. <laughs> As human beings, we have done a lot of bad things against creation, against nature, and somehow it can also be important to ask pardon of the cats, and even of the rats. In Stockholm, you see a lot of rats, and we don't like them, but somehow they belong to our world. Yeah, they are part of the universe, and somehow we have to find this harmony between all living creatures. And yeah, forgiveness has some universal meaning. Um, I'm a vegetarian for that reason, and um, I was, I've just been thinking the last few days about this great sentimentality we have towards animals, which I partake in, and I adore pet my pets, and the pharaonic funerals we have in America now for our pets. If we become more compassionate towards animals than people, <laughs> We find it easier to have, have animals displaced our feelings for our feelings. I've been wondering that the last few days. It's, it's, it's easier to forgive the cat for killing the mouse than it is for the co-worker who always leaves the coffee pot empty and doesn't refuse to refill it when he takes the last cup or whatever it is. The annoyances we have with people. Anyway, I just, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. In many cases, I think it's true that for many people it's too difficult to cope with other people. Animals are always affectionate, they're always there, they don't make any trouble, they don't accuse you of anything. So for many people, well, it's the only way to find some warmth, some affection, to have a little dog or a little cat or a little mouse. And there is something tragical about it, but 
Also something helpful. <laughs> you don't find any human affection, any human help. There can always be a little animal showing you that you're worth something. But it can also be a temptation that people are too difficult to cope with. So I concentrate upon, well, my little pets. Yeah. No, but it's part of our human history that we seem to be expert to make life difficult for one another. And then, when we cannot really cope with reality, there is always something else. Even if it's not an animal, it can be an iPhone or... Yes, there are so many little consolations that help you to survive. But there's also something tragical about that, of course. That, um, in many uh, homes for elderly people, they bring in dogs. Because they have not persons who have time to speak to the old people. But there is always a dog giving a bit of consolation. That's beautiful, but it's also tragical that people have not time to take care of old people, so they have to bring in some animals to keep them happy. In Japan, they're using robots yeah. <laughs> for going from the human to the mechanical. Yeah. Well, we are on the way. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just a bit of We wanted to share this conversation with all of you, so. What do you guys have to say? We, could, we have a few minutes left that we can have questions or comments. Or oh, I think there's a microphone somewhere. Anyway. Absolutely. Here's a microphone. Yes. Was you, you yeah. Sorry. That first. Hello. So, uh, my name is Henrik, and I, I've enjoyed listening to your conversation. Thank you for letting us be part of it. And I was thinking of something you said in the beginning about how we need an authority to forgive us. Something, um, and I was thinking, given the lack of, of, of faith in our society today, I mean, who, who can really forgive us? How can we find an authority without faith so that the forgiveness actually can matter? And, and maybe there is another way. I'm just curious on your thoughts on that. Thank you. Well, you actually could say that forgiveness is a divine privilege. And somehow you have to believe that there is something more in order to see the full force of forgiveness. Of course, as a believer, it's easier to see the deep mystery of forgiveness as a gift of God. And maybe that's why it's more difficult to forgive in a totally secularized uh, surrounding. But uh, even in Sweden, that is supposed to be very secularized, I think. There is more openness to this religious, mysterious force of forgiveness than we think. But it's true, no stately authority can say you are forgiven. And the media do not forgive, the internet does not forgive, and a politician who paid Toberone with a credit card of the government will that will always be remembered in something typical Swedish society. Politician paid a piece of chocolate with the credit card of the <laughs> government. And that is always remembered, not forgiven, really. So I, I would say that if I speak as a theologian, I would say that forgiveness is a kind of proof or sign that there is someone greater than me who can help us to do this. I know for many people it can be difficult to see that, but for me it's, it's a mystery of our existence that we can forgive. 
we have been given that capacity. It's really a mystery that it is possible for a human being to forgive even those first things that they It's but up an interesting point that I hadn't thought about with the era of the internet. We have infinite memory. We're getting increasingly infinite memory. I shudder to think, and I Google my name, what kinds of things I've said or done in the past might pop up. Um, I went back to, uh, I began at the Michigan Daily at the, in Ann Arbor, and they're now trying to digitize all the past issues. And I, I saw some of my old articles when I was at a reunion last September. I, I didn't think there'd be a hole deep enough to bury them. <laughs> And instead, it's getting. But you, you know, you see the drunken party you were at, and the photos are on Facebook. And there's no the capacity to forgive is not grown, and yet the inability to erase anything one's done is disappearing. It's a real dilemma. <laughs> I'm sorry. Somebody. Oh, I, I, anyway, you had a question. I, okay. I think I okay. Speak. Yeah, yeah. The one last question. The house closes at seven. No hurry, though. But yeah, okay. this is <laughs> last question. <laughs> um, I was just wondering that uh, these concepts of forgiveness are, in my opinion, closely related to concepts of power and justice, uh, and uh, the feeling of justice in 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 various forms of in society. When we are penalizing, for example, we're talking about con uh, concepts as. Uh, distributive justice uh, versus restorative justice. Uh, these are uh, concepts often used in mediation and to transform conflict situations. Um, but I just wondered that story about Joseph. If Joseph had not become such a successful and powerful man and perhaps just a beggar, uh, uh, would that concept of forgiving, uh, would, would that have been uh, looked otherwise? Would that have had a different uh, perspective in relation to both justice and, 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 the, and, and power relationships? Mr. No! <laughs> it's very interesting. I, one of the things that Renee said, Renee Girard, and I'm not sure that this is answering, I'm thinking out loud, um, is that the story of the Bible, I mean, it's very political in America. You know, people talk about the Bible as if it's one book written at one time. And of course it's not. It's been written over a couple thousand years. It's an anthology of books. It's a library of books. And it shows the evolution of a people And it's very different from even Joseph. It's even it's very different from uh, what was it the, the book where everyone gets is constantly killing everybody else. It's very different from that to the time you get to Isaiah. So you do have those kinds of people in the New Testament. You do have those people that wind up as, as beggars. It's what happened is, but in the Old Testament, it does feel like there's more of a tendency. They have to have some sort of power. They're still establishing themselves. They're trying to keep themselves from being wiped out. I guess I'm trying to, as I'm thinking out loud, trying to contextualize it within a society where power means a lot more in those early chapters of the Old Testament. I mean, look, I mean, the ultimate beggar was the guy that was the highest man that ever lived that got nailed to a piece of wood and allowed to hang there till he died. You can't get much. I mean, that's the ultimate forgiveness. And his last words were forgiving. So I guess that's that's the difference between the that's the evolution of those people from these early stories to that. But I have a crack at it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming here. Thank you, Alexander and Alice Interpress, and thank you, Anders Aborelius and Cynthia Haven. Uh, if I correctly informed, uh, you can go to seek the Seek Tuna Literature Festival and listen to Cynthia. You're going to be at the festival in Seek Tuna.
this weekend. We'll be talking about Eastern about European poets. Okay. That's my thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do have a look at the, We're closing now, but do have a look at the books. Uh, we won't chase you out. Tell the guards. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And we, I think we give Anders and Cynthia a round of applause. Thank you.